Hello everybody. Welcome to Bright Memorial Library and our Book Sandwiched In program. I'm Dina Viviani, the programming librarian here at BML. Just to start with a few housekeeping announcements. First, for safety purposes, if there is a need to evacuate the building, the door to my right, your left, is the closest exit. For anyone using a hearing aid, we invite you to take advantage of our induction loop system. It amplifies all sound coming through the microphone. And along those lines, when um, Mike is ready for Q&A, please make sure you wait until this microphone is with you so that we can all hear. Please silence or turn off your cell phones now so as not to disrupt the speaker. And we'd like to thank the Friends of Bright Memorial Library for sponsoring this program and our Book Sandwiched In series. Please do check the Book Sandwiched In flyers. We've got some in the table in the back. Um, for our title for next month, which is Facing the Mountain, a true story of Japanese American heroes in World War II by Daniel James Brown. And grab one of our Janu pro January program brochures. A lot of our programs are shifting to virtual again, um, but please do check, check online, um, see what we've got by video, um, because we are still offering programs despite the pandemic. And now I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Mike Bergen and from his website, in his own words. Uh, tens of thousands of students a year prep for the SAT and ACT through programs that Mike has created, oversaw, or organized. And after over 25 years of intensive experience in every aspect of standardized test prep, he knows what works best in prep and what does not. Uh, he's a nationally recognized leader in test prep, and Mike founded Chariot Learning in 2009 to deliver on the promise of what truly transformative individualized education can and should be. And Mike and I actually met here when his children were going to the discovery room, and I was working in the children's center, and he asked if we ever wanted to host any practice ACT or SATs here. And when he said they were free, I said, sure, let's try it. And um, we've been friends and colleagues since, so I'm happy to have him here. He's also the um, founding president of the board of directors of the National Test Prep Association, which is a nonprofit dedicated to promoting the highest ethical standards and best practices in the test prep industry. He's also the founder of the free testing and admissions answer site TestBright and a co-host of Tests and the Rest, which I had the privilege of being on this podcast however many years ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. Anything pre-COVID. <laughs> I don't know when that was anymore. Uh, he is also um, the co-author of the Amazon bestseller Crash and Learn Lessons in Business. He was born and raised in the Bronx, and Mike loves raising his two kids in Rochester, but brings them back to New York City often so they don't lose their edge. He is also a birder and a publisher and nature writer at 10,000 Birds. And he also loves traveling the world and exploring new places and food and talking about girls with bright futures. Which That's right. So without any further ado, I will pass the mic, the mic to Mike and I'll hit the lights. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Dina. So yeah, my name is Mike Bergen. I'm here to speak with everyone about a really interesting book, Girls with Bright Futures. Uh, before we talk about girls, and talk a little bit more about myself, I want to bookend the story that Dina told that Dina and I first met when my family and I moved to Rochester 13 years ago. And my children were four and two at the time, and moved from New York City to come to what turned out to be a phenomenal community, Brighton. And now my daughter, who is two, is a volunteer at the library. And so did the employee. That's right. So that's, um, that's our journey with the library. And when I moved here, not long afterwards, I started Chariot Learning. And the purpose of starting Chariot Learning was just to continue to promote the highest quality test prep possible, really focusing on education and helping students reach their goals in school, in tests, and in life. I am a podcaster at the Test and the Rest College Admissions Podcast, and we publish podcasts two to five times a week. I get to speak with really fascinating experts in all different strands of college admissions, testing, and education. As a matter of fact, I, I plan on inviting the authors of this book to be on the podcast as well, because it's right in to, but I wanted to see how you guys thought about the book first. I don't want to get ahead of it. Um, I am a trainer for ACT, actually, all this week and during the evenings I've been training science teachers in New Orleans on how to 
integrate ACT prep into their classrooms. I'm the founder and president of the board of directors of the National Test Prep Association. So basically, for the last 27 years, anytime people are talking about testing, they're talking about admissions, I am part of the conversation. I want to be part of that conversation. So when this book came up, Dina thought, well, who talks endlessly about college admissions? That's this guy, right? So how many of you have read this book? Oh, that's fantastic. Good. Then we're going to have a lively conversation. And I wanted to address the book without giving away any of its secrets and talk about some of the big themes and how they may be relevant to us. Because if you've read the book, you know that it describes a world that not many of us can associate with. All right? So the authors, Tracy Dobmeyer and Wendy Katzman, are longtime friends, and this was their first collaboration, their first novel, and they did it together. And the tagline for the book is interesting and I think a bit suspenseful. Three women, three daughters, and they promise that they'll each get what they deserve. I mean, that sounds like a fortune, doesn't it? May you get what you deserve. And as you read the book, you get a sense that this is not necessarily meant for the best for all of the characters. So this is really juicy. It's a, you know, a little bit of a whodunit. Uh, and the theme of this book is college admissions extremes. Now I'll talk a little more about what I mean by that. But just, you know, if any of you are fans of Law and Order or any of those um, programs that are ripped from the headlines, this book was ripped from the headlines. And the headline, you guys might remember from a couple of years ago, Operation Varsity Blues. Has anybody ever seen the, Net, uh, the Netflix special on it? It's really juicy. If you like this book, you'll love this story and this dramatization. But you might remember some of the real life stars of this scandal. Lori Loughlin and her family, Felicity Huffman and her family, um, not William H. Macy, uh, he managed to stay out of it, uh, and actually 50 other families were arrested, many of them were uh, prosecuted, got massive fines, jail time, for trying to illegally and immorally and unethically turn the levers of power and privilege to gain access um, to the ultra elite colleges. And that's what the story is. So the main character in Girls with Bright Futures is Stanford University. And actually, Stanford University never appeared. Nobody ever actually goes to Stanford. But the specter of it looms large throughout. We have three different high school seniors that the story focuses on. Okay? The first is Winnie Presley. Winnie Presley is a hardworking, um, really successful student. She's at the top of her class. She's a volunteer. She. Um, she was really the model student in a school of really talented and motivated students. She's confident, she's kind, she's just the kind of student we'd all want as a daughter. And she has a hook, and this is important in the context of the story, and her hook is that she is, or at least it says on her application, she's a first generation college student. Okay. Another of the three girls that this is focused on is Brooke Stone. Brooke Stone is not a motivated student. Brooke and Winnie used to be friends. They're not friends anymore, but they're in the same class and they have to see each other all the time. Um, she has other things to do than school. She's got a busy life, but grades aren't really her motivation. She is passive in the college application process. Not really interested in her mother's top choice school for her. She has a great family wealth and celebrity. 
And that goes a long way when you're talking about uh, ultra-selective college admissions. The third of the trio is Chrissy Vernon. And Chrissy is also a top student. In fact, she is just a fraction of a point below Winnie in terms of class rank. But she is not a confident student. In fact, she is completely stressed. She's pulling at her hair noticeably. Her parents are very concerned about her. She's a little bit brittle, but ambitious. And she has a hook. When it comes to Stanford, both of her parents went to Stanford. So that double legacy should carry some weight. Okay, so all three of these girls are supposed to apply to Stanford. Let's talk about their parents. Chrissy's mother is Kelly Vernon. Okay, and Kelly has money. Okay, um, Kelly's husband is a very successful uh, CPA, and they have money, but they have extended all of their resources because they're not wealthy and they're trying to keep up with very wealthy peers. Kelly cannot trade wealth for access, so she deals with information. She is a parent volunteer and she uses her position at the head of influential parent groups at the private school that all the students attend to find out secrets. And, uh, if you think that sounds like there's a little bit of skullduggery going on, there absolutely is. She is not an honest trader of information. All right? um, she's married to Kevin, who is not as gung-ho about selling everything and pouring all of their resources into this drive to get Chrissy uh, into Stanford. Kelly is desperate. Okay, Alicia Stone another major character. And Alicia Stone is a high-flying CEO of tech company Aspire. Um, she is like the Steve Jobs of this story. She's wealthy, she's famous, she's constantly flitting from one speaking engagement or board meeting to another. Um, she is highly competent, highly motivated, some would say ruthless. All right. She's married to Brian, who is a former athlete and now kind of just takes care of the house or gives her more work to do. Alicia can be characterized as desperate. Mary Presley is the third mother of these three teens. Marin works for Alicia. Okay, so Marin is Alicia's personal assistant. Marin came from or Marin came from really dire straits. She was homeless, she was a single mother, um, she managed to get this job as Alicia's personal assistant, and really is like the major domo of her life, constantly working, um, even to the point where she has to fill in all of Alicia's responsibilities on all the volunteer groups at the school. So she's very connected, she's part of this school community, and Alicia, pays for Marin to go to this private school, Marin, uh, not Marin, Winnie, Marin's daughter Winnie, um, and Marin, like the other three women in the story, is desperate. She's desperate because a lot of things are happening. We jump right into action when the story begins, but before we get into that, we're going to talk about Elliott Bay Academy because Elliott Bay Academy is the setting for this story. This is a premier, ultra-selective, private high school in Seattle, all right? And so all of the wealthy and elite in the area send their kids there, and it is supposed to be a feeder to the most prestigious colleges. Ted Clark is the head of school, and head of school in a private school like this is a very challenging position because you are managing lots of parents, some of whom are millionaires or billionaires, some of whom are celebrities, all of whom are striving. And that's an important element. And that tone, that atmosphere of striving pervades 
the entire story. All right? So, what are some of the major themes? One of the themes in this book is of selectivity. All right? Elliott Bay Academy itself is selective. You pay an exorbitant amount of money to go there, to send your children there, you know, whether it's one or in the Vernon's case, three children. They're paying a ton of money and really stretching their funds to get all three into the school because of the perception that attending this elite private school is the path to elite higher education, which ostensibly, what many characters in this book feel, that is the only path to a secure financial future. All right? Now, selectivity amps up as you start looking at colleges. And, you know, although there are thousands of colleges out there, there are many that fit into what you might consider selective or as some people seriously call it, rejective. Um, and the ultra-selective, what this book really focuses on as the top of the top tier, the Ivy Plus schools, which includes not just the traditional Ivy League schools, but schools like MIT and Stanford, University of Chicago, they are tremendously successful um, at, at whipping up a frenzy to have people consider them uh, that acceptance to a school like this the achievement of a lifetime, one that will set you up for future success. And this is why these schools have acceptance rates in the single digits. Okay, For every 10 students that applies to a school like this and 10 self-selected elite candidates who apply to a school like this, in previous years, pre-COVID, maybe um, eight out of a hundred might get into, uh, might be accepted. These days, it's half that. The enrollment rate for the most selective schools in the country last year were below 4%. Right? And imagine, so we're talking about the three candidates that we described all have these hooks because when you're looking, not at normal college admissions, but selective and ultra-selective college admissions, you're looking for hooks. And that is besides grades, besides test scores, besides extracurricular activities, besides essay, great recommendations, all of those things, to have absolutely perfect attributes across the board in those areas is just the first step. And then you still need something else to set you apart. And that could be that could be that you're a first generation student or you represent an institutional priority. It could be that you are bringing massive wealth and it's not just enough to say you're not asking for financial aid. It used to be that if you donated a million dollars to a, an ultra selective school, that got you somewhere. <laughs> These days, the price tag is much higher. For example, in this book, Alicia donates $15 million to Stanford and still does not feel certain of her daughter's chances. Okay? Um, legacy used to be really valuable, so the prospect that um, Chrissy Vernon is a double legacy, that used to carry a lot of weight, and we can think throughout history of famous politicians who got into schools that maybe they were not academically suited for, but because they were part of the lineage of that school. Uh, but in this case, and in modern day America, the value of legacy is also eroding in these highly selective schools. So really, people don't know what's going on, but selectivity, the ability to pour all of your resources and push all of your chips into the center of the table to gamble, to get into one of these schools is considered by many of the characters in this book to be worthy, worth their time, actually worth their utter preoccupation. Obviously, where there's selectivity, there's competition. And <laughs> it is not to say that the students here, the girls who are featured in this book, feel highly competitive, okay? Winnie Presley 
is competing with herself, and she, you know, she feels like she is the best student in the school academically. She feels like she has what it takes to excel anywhere. She got her heart set on Stanford early, ever since Alicia Stone gave her a Stanford sweatshirt when she was 10 years old. But she's not negatively competitive with other students. Um, Chrissy Vernon is very competitive, but she internalizes that competition, so she works extremely hard and she pushes herself too far, and her mental health is clearly suffering throughout the book. Brooke Stone, the third girl, she's not competing at all. She does not buy into the competition and does not think that Stanford is even the right school for her. But that doesn't matter because the parents here are extremely competitive, okay? mainly Alicia and Kelly. Now, Alicia and Kelly and Marin are not necessarily the only parents whose children are planning to apply to Stanford. But the book opens with, uh, in part, a revelation that this school, Elliott Bay Academy, which sends lots of students to Stanford each year, that only one more seat's available. And it's because the athletes, so athletes are like a special class, right? That's another hook that Ivy League schools, Ivy Plus schools use to pull certain students in. And all of the athletes that declared for Stanford used up all but one seat left. So the school was notified, Stanford would be accepting one student, that leaked out to all the parents, and suddenly there is scarcity where many of these girls Imagine that they would be applying side by side. The parents found out there's only one seat left. And that starts a lot of competition, a lot of angling, a lot of how do you say you employ the mother of a very likely candidate? How do you signal to her that you don't want her daughter to apply to the school that you want your daughter to go to? Is that ethical? Is that possible? Is that as far as you will go to try to eliminate competition? What about somebody who works, uh, who volunteers at the school and digs up all kinds of information? How far would a person who felt that her daughter deserved that spot go to undermine the applications of other students? <laughs> this book? It holds nothing back. It, it, it imagines how far people might go if they are feeling really desperate for their daughters to have an unfettered shot at being applied, uh, at being accepted to a school like Stanford. Resources come into play. When we talk about resources, we're usually talking about privilege and the fact that things seem really easy for a character like Alicia Stone can literally throw $15 million at a problem, who has celebrity, has wealth, has lots of people eager to help her in her goals for her family, all right? But information, as we described, information is a valuable commodity. As far as resources go, that's big. Um, Marin Presley, and I'll say this about the authors, I think anybody who could read this book can attest, you never really wonder who should be the hero of this book. <laughs> who are the heroes? Who are the sympathetic characters, okay? Marin and Winnie are highly sympathetic characters. Um, but they are resource deficient, all right? Single mother and daughter trying to make ends meet. She works multiple jobs. Not only is she the assistant for Alicia Stone, but she works other jobs sometimes for other parents at Elliott Bay Academy to try to move things forward. And she has no idea how she's going to pay for Winnie's college, except that Marin prom uh, Alicia promised she would pay for Winnie's college, which is another resource or another way to compete. So, interestingly, <clears throat> the story 
does not suggest that anyone can make it this far without resources, and Marin pulls together some expected and unpredictable resources by the end of the book. Okay, last but not least, inscrutability. Okay, inscrutability really <laughs> describes college admissions in the year 2022. That's our year, right? <laughs> Always beginning of the year, it's hard to remember. Um, but this year, last year, every year, we don't know exactly what colleges want. We hear what colleges tell us they want. And when we put together everything that colleges say they want and what they do, not everything adds up. Not everything seems authentic, genuine, or honest. And inscrutability is a game that the ultra-selective schools play to drive up the frenzy that people have to gain access, but it's also a tool that all of these characters use with each other. There is a lot of holding information back, there is a lot of misdirection, there is a lot of fear that each one will figure out what the other one is doing. Which is to say, again, a highly competitive environment, but an environment where the tone is established from the top down. Because nobody really knows, regardless of what someone from a school like Stanford says, nobody really knows exactly what it takes to get into a school like that. Now, this is Stanford, right? And this is the tone that many colleges set in that it is in every college's best interest to get as many applicants as possible so that they can select the ones that meet their internal priorities and the lower their acceptance rate, that's one of the metrics that pushes them further up in the rankings. It is unfortunately, it's a vicious cycle that continues to perpetuate itself. It doesn't always have to be that way. Okay, so the idea of perspective creeps through at different points in this story. It's unfortunately it's lacking in a lot of characters that really have no sense of how to look at the college admissions process, to look at how, um, what matters in college admissions, what really happens if you get into a particular school, or even is such a prize worth destroying everything else. Now, having read this story and having seen, <laughs> having worked with so many families over so many years, the message of perspective is one I wanted to bring to this group to talk about the fact that this is not what college admissions is like for 99, I think 0.9 percent of students. This is not what college admissions is like in Brighton. It's not what, if Elliott Bay Academy is not what Harley or Allendale Columbia are like. That's not, that's not the environment there at all. So if anybody read this and thought, wow, I can't believe that's what it takes to get into college these days. It's not what it takes to get into college these days. Now that said, that said, Knowing that I was coming to talk to everybody, I consulted Jenny Vigiani from Brighton High School. Jenny, please. <laughs> so grateful that Jenny came because I led with a question. I said, all right, I'm reading this story about all these girls that want to go to Stanford. And when I moved to Brighton 13 years ago, you know, I came from downstate New York, okay? Born and raised in the Bronx. I worked for Kaplan covering Westchester, Rockland, Putnam, Dutchess, Bronx, big chunk of downstate. So, anybody here familiar with Scarsdale High School? All right. If you're familiar with Scarsdale High School, you know that this is an example of a public school, just like Brighton High School or Pittsburgh Southern, Pittsburgh Men, and a lot of the schools in our area. Top tier academics, phenomenal students, but it is a pressure cooker. It is like it is like Elliott Bay Academy in some ways, in that kids there feel tremendous stress. 
And when I found a school like Brighton where the quality of academics and extracurriculars that support the students get and the paths that students can take was right up there with these students. The test scores were right up there with these students. But the pressure was so much better. I felt relieved about having moved. If anybody here is from downstate, if you grow up in New York City, you can't really imagine moving to Rochester. <laughs> But here I am, and I'm happy to be here. Um, but so I asked today, I said, listen, how many Brighton High School kids got into Stanford last year? Now, a number of students from Brighton did apply. And I have no doubt that a lot of them matched up really favorably with the kind of candidates that are set up here. But nobody got it. Nobody got in the year before, the year before that, the year before that. Understand correctly, Jenny, it hasn't been since 2014 that we've sent the students to Stanford. Okay, so I'm preaching perspective. At the same time, I don't want to sound idealistic about the fact that anybody from any school can at any time get into one of these ultra selective schools because that's not the way things are designed anymore. We absolutely do, in the Rochester area, send school students to the Ivy Plus schools. A handful, a couple, a couple of kids from Monroe County go to, uh, go to Harvard every year. That's not because only a couple of kids could thrive there. Only a couple of kids match up. But there is a mania to what's involved with, not only does everything need to be perfect across the board, but there needs to be hooks. Jenny, am I characterizing this accurately? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> she didn't know she was speaking. <laughs> You can, you know, feel astonished at some of the extent to which some of the characters will go. But I don't think that, that the authors were wrong when they spoke about everybody getting what they deserved. And the way to make sure our teens get what they deserve in the process of figuring out life after high school whatever that path is, whether it's for your college, to your college, a trade, military, taking some time to figure things out, whatever that is, requires authenticity. Requires students to be willing to be themselves to the fullest extent possible. And it requires their parents and their grandparents and their peers to accept them for who they are. Authenticity is key and there is a glaring lack of that in some of the characters in the book. And so we say, well, no, authenticity leads to happiness. Okay? Suitability. Truth is, is that some of the students who were applying to Stanford in this fictitious competition, on paper, looked like they would be phenomenal candidates. And just to be fair, when 100 students apply to a school and only four students get in, that doesn't mean that 96 
were not qualified. 96 could not have survived or thrived if they got in. Just means that that's the way the dice rolled. And those students, you'd imagine, would excel just about anywhere else, okay? But finding the right path, finding the right school, should be the mission of the college admissions exploration process, is to what is the right school, right? What is the right program? What is the right size of school? Where is the right place, right? One reason why Stanford was so important is because it was the most selective school on the West Coast, and they were based in Seattle, right? If they were based in Chicago, if they were based anywhere in the Midwest, then they probably would have been looking at University of Chicago because that was within that 150 miles that most institutions draw a large percentage of their students, right? So we think about all those different qualities. Suitability is key. You can't make something fit if it doesn't fit. Perspective, still, it's the biggest word, okay? If your family's going through the college admissions process, or you know families that are going through the college admissions process, or that's way down the line, perspective is an incredibly valuable tool for you, for your teens, for everybody involved, okay? At the end of the day, we work with so many families. I meet so many families in this process. And when families care and students are motivated and people are willing to put in the work to find the right fit, one way or another, it works out. Just the willingness to do the work, to figure out what is the best path for me, where should I go, what is right for our family, those conversations set you up for success wherever you want that. All right, I've spoken long enough. <laughs> questions or comments from people who have read the book or people have questions about either the book or the larger college admissions process. All right, I'm gonna ask the first question because I have the mic so I can. So have you, have you found in your job, and I can say this now as a parent with a kindergartner in Brighton. It's way too young for your daughter right, to start right. worrying about Stanford. So this is exactly it. So I'm like, I have her parents. Right. I have joked with some of my coworkers and, and friends here who I'm like, I have other kindergarten parents asking me if like what I think of the curriculum. And I'm like, I'm just glad she's not eating paste. She's fine. But how many students do you see who, like some of the characters in the book, have completely different wants from what the parents seem to want for their kid? So you have families that come to you and want help, and clearly the parents on a different, like how do you handle that? So that is so common. Jenny, you would agree, right? Yeah. So when it comes to college, when it comes to testing, you have two different parties. You have the parents, you have the student. And in the college admissions, you know, I know a lot of people that work with families to try to, they put together a school list, a list of great schools. And it's really important to have separate conversations to find out what are the schools that the parent wants, what are the schools that the student wants, and how do they overlap. When it comes to testing, I usually hear from parents of teens about setting up SAT or ACT prep. And I always ask the question, did your son or daughter ask you to make this call? And if they say, yeah, that's great. If they say no, but I know that they're motivated, that's great too. The parents that tell me, well, no, and, and she's really gonna be disappointed when she hears that I signed her up for the class. I say, maybe you shouldn't bother. <laughs> Unless you're going to take a class for her because you can't make somebody want what they don't want. And this book really highlights that no matter what we as parents or guardians or, or support uh, family go through to try to push somebody in a certain direction, if they don't want to go, they're not going to go. All right, who else has a question or comment? I think you touched on this, Mike, but um, I was astonished to find, from what I understood, that some of these elite colleges actually recruit high-performing students just so they can reject them. 
I, is that true? Well, <laughs> I, I would say I would say that they recruit everywhere. Okay, so here's here's kind of the way things go for your typical high school student. All right. Students take the PSAT, Brighton High School students, this is like a lot of students in New York State, take the PSAT in October of junior year. All right? Whether they've taken an SAT or an ACT before that, whether they go to a school where they took the PSAT or the pre-ACT in 10th grade, they take the PSAT in October of junior year. And every college gets the list of students that took the test. And the higher a student score, the more pieces of material. Now, it used to be lots of physical material clogging up your mailbox. Today, I think a lot of it might be email too, uh, but they're sending all kinds of stuff. They might even send you some um, swag <laughs> to try to get you excited. The higher your PSAT scores, the more schools you're going to hear from. Because at the, at the end of the day, a selective school, and I'm not just going to talk about the Ivy Plus schools, We'll talk about every name brand school. Every name brand school, including schools like University of Rochester, RIT. They'll get 10 or more times the number of applicants as available seats. And every applicant pays to, set, to, to have that applicant reviewed. So last year, you know, test optional policies expanded the applicant pool tremendously. Where, you know, now, you know if previously, 10 times the number of students would apply. Now it's 15 to 20 times the number of students as available seats would apply. They are all paying to have their applications considered. Still only the same number of students will get in and the selectivity, you know, the selectivity ramps up. So I'm not saying that they target, they specifically target high achievers because they don't have to. Um, one high achieving student doesn't make them look any better by being turned away. But in aggregate, giving everybody the idea that you're sure you could get it, when, when the fact is, is that, you know, again, only a handful. It's, it's like those uh, New York lottery commercials. All it takes is a dollar and a dream, and mostly you're out of a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a follow up to that, um, and maybe Jenny can comment too. Um, with the pandemic, have you noticed? ACT and SAT scores declining overall, or are students who are motivated still motivated and doing as well? And then, on the other hand, is it better to take an ACT or SAT and do math, or to not take it and then just apply to these schools who've expanded their pools? Jenny, you want to answer first? Oh, no, you are an expert on that. No. So, okay. <laughs> She's very polite to defer to me here. She, she knows. Um, so I'll, say, I'll answer the first question. Are test scores going up or down? Okay. Across the country, we really have no idea what's happening with test scores because um, 2020 or, you know, the beginning of 2021 was a weird time. Um, or actually 2020, where it was hard for a lot of students to test. And we're starting to catch up in terms of the fact who is testing, because a lot of kids that traditionally would have tested think that they don't need to, all right? We also have colleges, and this is what's happening today, is that students will apply, and the admissions office will say, well, what did you get on the SAT or ACT? And if the score doesn't reach a certain level, they'll say, don't submit your score. It doesn't mean you're getting in without the score, but they don't want their mid-50, if you know what I'm talking about in Naviance or any of the other um, systems that tell you what kind of test score schools are looking for, they will give you the 25th to 75th percentile range of test scores from last year's incoming class. And the higher that is, the more selective the school is, even if they're test optional. So a school like University of Rochester had, was famously test optional well before the pandemic. But the mid-50 for SAT and ACT scores for University of Rochester is quite high. The University of Chicago, again, famously test optional for the ultra-selective school, but if you're going to submit scores, your score better be a 99th percentile plus 
If you're going to submit an ACT score, it better be a 34 or higher. The maximum ACT score is 36. All right. So what's happening functionally is that the scores that students should submit at this point are pretty much 50th percentile or higher based on that mid 50. And we're hoping that that doesn't continue to creep up because that, again, is a gamesmanship that, is, that makes the college admissions process more difficult for everyone except the institutions of higher education themselves. Should students take the tests? Well, I'm a big proponent of students taking the test in practice first before they take official tests anyway. And, um, you know, friends of the Brighton Library know that because Brighton Library hosts free proctored practice SATs and ACTs. We work together to provide every year, whether it's in person or online, because students should get that kind of practice to have a sense of where they are. But yes, it is a great idea to take the SAT and or the ACT, try to get the best score possible. If the scores still do not support the application, then for a test optional school, you probably don't want to include that. But when it comes to selective college admissions, nothing is optional. Okay? When it comes to really selective college admissions, it's not just like good grades, you should have good grades. No, you should have phenomenal grades. And you should have, you know, you should show academic curiosity and rigor equal to the level of the school that you're applying to. If you know, extracurriculars are not optional, and not only that, you really need to show leadership and longevity and success in your chosen um, extracurricular activities. Every single part of an application for a selective school should be as strong as possible. Tests are not an exception. Hi, um, I'm just curious. Number one, about do you know anything about the transfer rate of kids who get into these schools that are pushed by their parents who may not have the enthusiasm to go there? And the second part is, frequently on TV after admissions, I remember this one broadcast so clearly. This one young man got into every single Ivy League school, bar none. And then there was a young woman, same qualifications, applied, got into nothing. So I'm very interested in your comments about such a situation. Thank you. Great questions. I'll speak to the second one first because it really is testament to how much luck is involved in college admissions. You know, that moment when you apply early decision, early action, or regular admit, and you've pieced together, and when I say you, it's not just a student, right? It's the student, and the parents, and the counseling team, and maybe the other supports that come in as a team to put together an application that really represents the best of the student, and you press submit, right? At that point, it's pretty much out of your hands. And it is unfortunate that there's simply not room for every qualified student at every suitable college. So, yeah, there are cases where students are qualified, not just qualified, but you know would thrive at any school. And they don't get into any of them, right? There are also cases where students get into schools that are not the right fit for them. And they transfer or they abandon, you know, there's a statistic that has been lingering for a long time, and I don't think this number has improved at all, that one in four students who apply and enroll at a four-year school fail to make it to the second year. Uh, persistence for graduation at a four-year school is around 66%, which means a third fall away before getting their degree. And a lot of students don't get their four-year degrees in four years anymore. We're talking about five years, six year count. Okay? So there are transfers. There are people that transfer back. There are people that drop out. There are also people that transfer from one school to a more selective school. There are students that take the path where if they don't get into the elite school they're looking for at first, they go to another school and they build a great resume there, and then they transfer up. Or they start at a two year school and then they finish out at a four-year school. 
there's so many different paths that families could take, especially if they bring perspective to this process and realize that when you get your acceptance letter or your deferral letter or the, I'm sorry, we just don't have a place for you in the class at this time, that's not the end of anything. That is just the next step in the process. I think Linda was also referring to like gender in, the, in your comment too, like that a guy would get into all the acceptance or like are the ACTs or SATs, like that's come up somewhat recently. Do they skew favorably for certain races or classes? Well, no, I'm glad that you bring this up because gender, um, boys are underrepresented in college admissions. More girls apply to college, but of course colleges don't want 60 girls, 40 boys in the population, so there is an advantage in that sense. Um, and you know, very often um, girls have better grades. Traditionally, the SAT, uh, definitely SAT math skewed towards boys. Right now, that's not such so big a difference. But, I mean, there's a little bit there, but it's not a, it's, that's not the reason why boys have an advantage based on their qualifications and admissions. It's simply that you want, and a lot of college admissions has to do with institutional priorities. And that is not a bad thing in that colleges want the most diverse, most representative, most interesting class Possible. So one example I'd like to use when I talk about institutional priorities and how they may seem unfair in certain ways is say you are the head of admissions at Cornell, right? Cornell has its choice, especially from Monroe County, right? Cornell brings lots of students in. We send lots of students to Cornell, don't we? Um, and they have their choice, right? But you're sitting there and the admissions office say, well, this is great, we have lots of New York students, where are North Dakota students? <laughs> and they start digging through the pile and they say, oh, I've got one North Dakota application. You might squint at some of the bad numbers and maybe not look at them because you want to make sure you have a student from every state in the country, right? That's just one of many institutional priorities to make sure that the students who are arriving on campus have a great community to be part of. So institutional priorities, they work lots of different ways and sometimes the student has the hook. And that might be the hook. I grew up on a farm in North Dakota and I farmed rocks or whatever it is they farm there. <laughs> and then when I get an Ivy League education in upstate New York, that's a great hook. Um, well, a couple of follow-ups. Do you find, first of all, if you take a gap year, which is like this new thing, that I didn't even know about. Uh, are, are your test scores still good after a year? Yes. They are. Okay. And have you ever followed up on students once they've gotten their degree from their chosen school? Do they actually go into the uh, the career? The field which they that got they majored degree? in. All right. So let me speak to the first. I wanted to talk about a gap year. Um, in a lot of cases. And Jenny, let me know if I'm wrong about this. In a lot of cases, students will apply and be accepted to a school and then let them know they're taking a gap year. So there's that kind of gap year where it's intentional and everybody knows about it and you're accepted and you know that you have a spot at the school. Um, then there are the, you know, kind of the unconscious gap years where you just stop for a year or two. And test scores last for a while. And you know, usually a student who's not transferring and isn't returning after 20 years or so will need to provide some kind of test score that's valid. Now, as far as major to career, that's much larger conversation than we could get into, especially because nobody really has an answer to that. It has a lot to do with the particular major, the particular career path, and the school, and the industry at a given time. It's just such a multivariate equation. Sorry, I can't give you more information on that. The answers are hard to come by. All right, we have the time for one last question, and then I'll see if Jenny has any last thing she wants to say or add, and then you've got time to wrap up. There was a lot of emphasis on the essays to the point where 
one, I, I don't know if it was Alicia or not, actually hired a college professor to write the essay. Yes, which is illegal. You might have picked up in the book. Really it is illegal to do that. <laughs> but I was just wondering, um, are those essays really all read? I mean, does somebody in the admissions office actually read 10,000 yeah. essays? <laughs> essays are really and important. To what extent are they important? It's hard to believe that 650 words could be so meaningful. But the essay represents, out of the entire application, it's the one place where a student basically has the microphone and can say something that doesn't come through the rest of the application to convey character, kindness, ambition, some dimension of their personality, a really effective essay can carry an application a long way. A lackluster essay doesn't do anything for the application. And again, when we're talking about selective admissions, when we're talking about selective admissions, it's like, you know, you're rowing crew, right? If every person rowing does their job, you can win. If somebody is not pulling their weight, you're not gonna make it. So the essay becomes more important when every piece of the application needs to be more important. Jenny? Well, I don't have... well thank you for having me. I'm glad you reached out. Um, it's nice to get out of the office, especially <laughs> given the current uh, circumstances. So it's so nice to see different faces and, and be here at the library, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, Mike is truly an expert in this field. I wish I had him in my office with me, so he can validate everything. Um, that he's saying that I agree with. It's, it's really great to have him in this community and, and we have him as a resource. He volunteers regularly to come to Brighton and speak with our students on a variety of uh, topics, college admissions being one of them, but SAT and ACT prep for sure. So um, everything he said is, is validating for me to hear that. Oh, uh, I love that. Shade. We're recording that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Brighton is a, a really special place. Um, I live here. I have two students at the high school, one in ninth grade, one in twelfth grade, and um, Mike uh, did uh, some test prep with my twelfth grader, um, and everything he said is absolutely accurate. Um, he needed it for some schools and didn't need it for others, and, and it, it played out exactly the way he said. So I don't have anything to add. What is the what is the top school that, that most Brighton students apply to, and then what is like approximately the top school most students get into. Can I tell the truth here? Yeah, please. The top school that Brighton students apply to is MCC. Uh, the number one uh, percentage of the percentage of students that go to MCC is the highest percentage um, of students uh, for any school. But the number one school, it would probably be a SUNY school. I didn't bring that information with me, but uh, it would probably be a SUNY school. You say yeah, I would concur. Probably Binghamton. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but we have students, if you look, you can, we have it on our website, our profile every year. It's right the VHS profile, and it shows all the schools that students apply to, the percentage of students getting into each school, our um, mean score for our SATs and our ACTs. Um, it's, it has a, a ton of information. Um, but we have students, you know, early decision just this year. We have students that, that got into Dartmouth, students that got into Cornell early decision. Um, Students that got into I mean, Princeton, Yale, uh, they were pursued, awaiting her decision on Harvard, um, and all the way to, to MCC, and gap years, and students that go into the vocational programs, and students that go into the military. So these are things I personally am very proud of that we have um, such a variety of options and opportunities. We work really hard to make sure that we provide information for all students. Um, still an imperfect system, but Really, we really work hard to do that, and with Mike's help, it's, it's a really nice, really nice system. Cool, thank you. It's an awesome note, and it, you know, it's really meaningful to recognize that MCC, Monroe Community College, is the most commonly attended school for every high school in our area. And MCC is a gem, and community college is a gem, especially as students are trying to figure out their next step. College, the college process, achieving a degree, represents a lot of different outcomes for a lot of different students. And 
Girls with Bright Futures is, is great. It's, you know, it's juicy, <laughs> it's sensational. It represents a pinhole look at all of the different options available to students. And we benefit from taking the broad view, especially when our kids, uh, not just their futures, but their mental health are concerned. Thank you so much, Mike.